Would the most brilliant mind in all three realms, Orohara Kisuke, be able to take down Soul Society? Orohara has always been a suspicious character, so if the roles were reversed and Orohara used his intelligence for the downfall of the Soul King, could Orohara succeed where Sosuke Aizen failed? First, we'll need to address just how powerful Kisuke Orohara is. If he's not able to perform the godlike combat feats required to dismantle an entire Gotei 13 when all your fodder underlings fail to finish the job, then this evil plan is all for naught. I think it's abundantly clear though, Orohara is not all brains. Before being exiled from Soul Society and becoming a humble candy shop owner, Orohara Kisuke reached the level of captain in the 13 court guard squads, putting Orohara at bare minimum captain level spiritual pressure and combat ability. Where Orohara excels compared to most other Shinigami is his unique upbringing. Orohara was raised in the noble Shihoan family, being trained from an early age among Soul Society's elite. After becoming third seat of the second division under Captain Yoroichi Shihoan, Orohara joined the stealth force and eventually worked his way up to head of the detention unit. As the warden of a prison of Soul Society's most high-ranking delinquents, Orohara was not only strong enough to keep every cellmate in line, he was also trained heavily in assassination. This background in covert ops explains how many times Orohara is able to lethally wound an opponent from the back without them ever knowing he was there. Depicting a Shinigami who's not afraid to fight underhandedly and willing to do whatever it takes for self-preservation. Urahara casually handles Espada level threats like Yami Largo, Wonderweiss Marjora, and even Lupi Antonar, who was Espada 6 at the time. And every Arankar in the Espada is stated to be at least captain level, if not higher. Espada number 4, Okiora Cypher, admitted even he would rather not fight an opponent like Kisuke. Orohara had time to playfully taunt the Espada that he fought, even analyzing and countering one of Yami's attacks in little to no time at all. Orohara is also one of the only combatants to not get one-shot by Sosuke Aizen in Fate Karakura Town, putting up a significant one-on-one -on -one brawl against Hogyoku merged Aizen that the latter admits he probably would have lost had Orohara jumped into battle anytime sooner. After Aizen merges with the Hogyoku and begins his ascension into a higher being, Aizen admits that although they were once equals in power, they are no longer which is a very telling compliment coming from Aizen of all people, one of the strongest characters in the series even by the end of Bleach. Orohara is able to compete against characters like Aizen or Asuka Naklavar in speed as well, two characters that easily surpass captain level speed on their own accord. Orohara is even able to keep up with Yoroichi Shihoan, one of the fastest captains in the entire series, as far as into her Shunko Thunder God battle form. The novels, which some people may discount even though they are effectively canon, so make your own opinion after these statements, Orohara is stated by the main villain of Can't Fear Your Own World, Tokinada Sunoyashiro, to have enough power to not only defeat Tokinada in a single spell, but his accomplice Ora Michibane as well. And for those not aware, Ora Michibane is a full bringer from Can't Fear Your Own World novels that is able to produce keto spells on par with Sosuke Aizen. Tokinata Suniyashiro is also a Shinigami from the Four Great Noble Houses and carries similar spiritual pressure to other Captain Class Shinigami like Byakuya Kuchiki or Yorichi. Orohara Kisuke is also stated to be among the six people capable of defeating Hikone Ubuginu, a Soul King level candidate, the highest level of power in Bleach, and a character that was stalemating three top tier Espada and two Sternritter, as well as fighting on pace with Zaraki Kenpachi for a time. The other five capable beings of killing Hakone were Ichigo Kurosaki and Ginjo Kujo, two other Soul King candidates, Kenpachi Zaraki and Sosuke Aizen just off their overwhelming power alone, and Mayuri Kurotsuchi along with Urahara, both being said to win based off their intelligence, amounting to a victory with prep time. Whether you want to take the novels at face value or not, Kisuke Orohara is still powerful enough for Yuhaba, the Quincy King, to designate Orohara a special war threat in Thousand Year Blood War, all because of Orohara's quote-unquote resourcefulness. Even Aizen admits Orohara has a more brilliant mind than his own, and Orohara makes good on this compliment by outsmarting Aizen multiple times in their fight. 
Urahara is also able to create an antidote to Asuka Naklavar's death dealing shrift, a toxic poison that can uniquely change depending on the Reiatsu it's dosing. Urahara is able to consider thousands of plans at once when combating an opponent, winning against unbeatable odds through either predicting an entire fight with near precognition levels of planning, shown when Urahara allies with Grimjow before the fight with Askin to set up a counterattack, despite not knowing how Grimjow would even fit into the fight before it happens, or Urahara isn't afraid to experiment on his friends. Also shown in the fight with Askin, where Yoroichi Shunko creates a constantly cycling Reiatsu formation that combats the base version of death dealing in exchange for taking away her intelligence. Orohara was able to easily decipher all of the Quincy's powers and Vol standings in mere moments of seeing them, and was ultimately the one who created a seal strong enough to restrain and imprison Hogyoku merged Aizen. On top of all of Orohara's base combat ability, he's an expert on Reiatsu, as well as Kido in all of its forms. When combined with Orohara's assassin mind, he can sneakily pull off universally lethal attacks like restricting Aizen's Reiatsu vents on his wrists without Aizen even noticing, causing him to implode from his own spiritual pressure. Orohara can also cast multiple high-level Kido one after the other in order to restrain and blow up Aizen, who, if not merged with the Hogyoku already, surely would have died from the combination of spells casted. And in this specific barrage of Kido, Orohara lets off Hado number 91, Senju Koten Taiho, a Kido that, according to the Can't Fear Your Own World novels, is stated to be around the same attack potency as an Espada's Grand Ray Zero a spiritual attack known to have the power to distort space. And if we were to refer to the novels once more, Urahara is also capable of casting Hado number 99, Goryu Tenmetsu, a spell only seen once in the main series that Aizen uses against Yuhaba. Urahara's version of the Kido is tweaked to not only absorb all reishi in its range, it's powerful enough to envelop a multiple kilometer spanning ocean conjured by fullbringer Oromichi Bane. Orohara is also canonically proficient in Kaido, otherwise known as Healing Kido. He's able to recover Ichigo from lethal wounds and potentially even himself if required. This adds to Orohara's already impressive stamina and durability. A character who endured multiple attacks from Hogyoku Aizen, Quincy Royal Guard Askin's Death Dealing, who was able to fight on par with Squad Zero members, and Urahara could also train Ichigo Kurosaki non-stop for five nights and five days of combat sparring with no breaks. If Urahara can be at all comparable to Ishin Kurosaki in stamina, Ishin withstood the Dongai's torture for months on end until Ichigo achieved the final Getsuga Tensho. Exploring all Kisuke Urahara has to offer, as opposed to just intelligence, is important for understanding why some of the Gotei 13 just don't stand much of a chance if Urahara turned evil. One of the first captains that come to mind is Sajin Komamura of the 7th Division, a captain class Shinigami that has been effortlessly embarrassed by Aizen on two accounts. Komamura's weakness is worn on his sleeve, with his Zanpakuto, Tenkin, Shikai, and Bankai making Komamura very vulnerable to damage. Komamura doesn't even have the durability to survive a non-encanted Kurohitsuji from Aizen, or a simple sword slash down his Bankai's torso. Komamura's final desperation Bankai wasn't even enough to finish off Bambi at a Bastard Bean. With Orohara's similar combat qualifications to Aizen and Orohara's adaptability, I think even if you put Thousand Year Blood War Komamura up against Orohara, Kisuke would just figure out Komamura's human immortality and wait out the time limit. Moving on, another captain that Orohara bests on combat feats alone would probably be Soifong captain of the 2nd Division and current head of Soul Society's Stealth Force. Even as far as Thousand Year Blood War, Soifong pales in comparison to Yorichi Shihoen when it comes to combat, speed, and Shunko mastery. Yorichi was casually able to neutralize Soifong's Shunko with an equal opposite force back in the Soul Society arc, proving even after a century apart, Yorichi was still stronger than Soifong. If we are to use the fact that Orohara can keep up with Yorichi way past Yorichi's base Shunko, and based on the 3 on 1 fight of Hogyoku Aizen versus Ishin Kurosaki, Yorichi, and Orohara, 
The three's attack potency must be somewhere somewhat comparable, if not higher on Kisuke's end, since he's the one that actually manages to crack Aizen's tough chrysalis exterior. Not only will Soifeng not be able to use her Bankai since Urahara already has the speed advantage, it'll be almost impossible to land her Shikai's death in two strikes. Soifeng couldn't complete the process against Yorichi or Aizen, making it hard to believe it would land on Urahara if he wasn't already able to find a way to override it entirely. Urahara can also use his Zanpakuto Benihime and its Shikai to fight from long range. After the command Awaken, Benihime becomes a large blade that's capable of conjuring crimson energy and manipulating it in a myriad of ways. Benihime can be used offensively, launching large shockwaves that are stronger than an Espada's Sero, and can pierce Lupi Antenor, Espada number 6's Hero armor, slicing off the latter's tentacles with ease. Benihime can also be used defensively, shown when Kisuke creates a large hexagonal shaped barrier that even could withstand a Getsuga Tensho from Ichigo Kurosaki. By analyzing a subject's reishi and muscle movements, Benihime can also identify and adapt to an opponent's technique, outright cancelling the attack if timed right at the point of contact. Giving Urahara the perfect response to Suzume Bachi's two death strike, although Urahara would most likely win before it came to that. With such a versatile Zanpakuto, combined with his high power level, Urahara can also defeat captains like Ukitaki Jushiro, the captain of the 13th division who is supposed to be one of the strongest captains of the Gotei 13, alongside Koraku Shunsui and Yamamoto Genrusai. However, due to Ukitake's illness, the captain spends so much energy keeping his body from keeling over that he's unable to reach his full potential. Which is truly a shame, because even Yamamoto talks Ukitake up as once being unmatched among his peers. This is proven when Ukitake, like Kyoraku, is able to put up somewhat of a decent fight against Captain Yamamoto when the two are together. The duo also fight pretty evenly against Espada No. 1, Coyote Stark, in fake Karakura Town. Ukitake is even capable of restraining fellow captains like Byaku Yakuchiki with just his bare hand when the situation calls for it. Ukitake's Zanpakuto, Sogyo no Kotawari, offers him no favors against Urahara either only having a Shikai which involves absorbing an opponent's energy attack and then redirecting it back at maximum power and speed. While this would allow Ukitake to counter Urahara's projectiles, Urahara is smart enough to just not let that happen, or worse, Urahara could analyze Sogyo no Kotawari and come up with a way to have it self-destruct or something from absorbing lethal energy of some kind. How could Urahara manage something like that? Well, Urahara has a multitude of inventions he can use in combat. From portable gigais that can be used like a substitution jutsu, a trick that Urahara can pull off so efficiently, even Sosuke Aizen fell for it, invisibility cloaks that allow Urahara to hide his presence entirely, using Kido to move amongst the atmosphere and not even tip off captain level Shinigami of his location. But most terrifyingly, Urahara also understands holification to the finest degree. To the point he can even create pills that induced holification. If Urahara could hide one of these pills in an attack that Ukitake absorbs, or find some other way like exploiting Ukitake's sickness, the possibilities are endless for a character who canonically thinks like Doctor Strange scanning alternate timelines. And none of this even takes into account the chance Urahara decides to stealthily just deliver death to his targets without confronting them fairly. Urahara has no problem shooting people in the back, and to be fair, if Urahara's firing spiritual blast that can kill Kurge Opi, a character who fought somewhat on par with Bankai Ichigo, on sight, I'd probably be worried about that outcome. Even if groups like the Visards became involved, it's still up in the air if they would be able to help against Urahara. Maybe if they attacked them all at once, which quite frankly is probably Soul Society's best way to handle Urahara as a threat. The Visards also have even more powerful Zanpak toes for fighting, like for example, Kensei Mugaruma, already an immensely strong captain when he led Squad 9, has a Zanpak toe named Tachikaze, with Shikai that creates wind slashes that explode on contact, and Bankai that follows it up by packing all of that explosive power into Kensei's fists. You also have Shinji Hirako, the captain of Squad 5 and leader of the Visards that was able to fight on even ground with Sosuke Aizen for a time, thanks to Shinji's Zanpakuto Sakanade and its Shikai ability that inverts an opponent's directions through their sense of smell. 
No matter how intellectually sound you are, it's proven the more experienced of a fighter you are, the harder you fall for Shinji's inverted world. Ingrained habits are harder to fight Shinji himself, although not impossible to overcome as Aizen himself proves. Last but not least, Captain of the 3rd Division Rose Otorabashi, while not having the greatest combat feats with his Zanpakuto Kinshara Shikai, does hold one of the most devastating Bankai of the current Gote 13. By creating real illusions for his opponents through sound, Rose can conjure real hallucinations of melting flames or drowning waves and kill an opponent with these physical illusions. If you add in the fact that all of them can don their hollow mask, which could be anywhere from a 5 to 10 times multiplication on their existing strength, on top of the already present 5 to 10 times buff that Shikai or Bankai already gives them, in response to these overwhelming odds, Kisuke Orohara has his own Bankai, Kanan Baraki Benahime Aratame. Manifesting a giant red-robed woman, the Zanpakuto has one simple ability in this stage, to restructure anything and everything it touches within a small range around Benahime's apparition. This can be used to provide both supportive restructuring as well as offensive buffs for durability and strength, while also presenting a threat to anyone that falls close to Kisuke's range, where they'll instantly become unwoven at the seams, splitting open into an endless void if the enemy can't react quick enough. In one single motion, Orohara's Bankai gives him an answer to every single Visor's power. Whether you believe it's necessary or not for Orohara to use it against any of these captains, it's really only to argue, without a shadow of a doubt, how overwhelming an evil Kisuke Orohara can be. As shown in Kisuke's fight with Asuken Naklavar, Orohara is able to use his Bankai to restructure his own body and reinforce it with the adjusted amount of strength required to conquer that enemy. This allows Orohara to improve his durability reflexively to his opponent, always ensuring he can overpower any threat. Kanan Baraki Benahime Aratame overrides a power type Shikai and Bankai like Kensei's Tachikaze with ease, as Orohara can just tank Kensei's explosions no matter how destructive they get. Orohara should have a speed advantage as well, considering Kensei was speed blitzed by Mask the Masculine, a much lower ranked Quincy than Asuken. With Orohara basically just building himself stronger than Kensei, Kensei would be powerless. Orohara also maintains his Zanpakuto in this release state, giving him no restrictions in plain combat either. This ability to just create the necessary strength and durability required to defeat any opponent is also going to be a problem for Shinji's inverted world, but for more reasons than just one as by restructuring his own nostrils and lungs before Sakanade releases, Orohara can just avoid the Shikai entirely. Shinji Zanpakuto invades the senses through a fog that's inhaled. Cutting that out of the equation, null and voids its inversion. But even if Orohara were to get struck by Sakanade, Orohara can restructure the nodes in his brain to just adapt to the opposite directions with ease rendering the inverted world useless as Urahara's senses are changed to better fight under the reverse motor functions as if nothing was different. A similar counter would be dealt to Rose Otorabashi and Kinshara's illusionary Bankai, as Rose's hallucinations take over the enemy through music. Canonically, Mass Demasculine destroyed his own eardrums to nullify this effect in his fight with Rose. Therefore, Orohara can rebuild his ears to cancel out Rose's Zanpakuto altogether as well. And considering a Quincy of Mass Demasculine's level was one-shotting Rose once his Zanpakuto failed, Orohara should easily be able to dismantle him. The worst case scenario for any of the captains, let's say if they tried to jump Orohara once Kanonbaraki Benahime Aratame is involved, Anyone that enters Benahime's range will be restructured and taken apart within moments of intruding in Urahara's territory. If any of the captains aren't fast enough to react, they could be torn at the seams in instance. However, any restructuring done to an opponent by Urahara's Bankai does become undone once they leave its range. Any restructuring Urahara's done to himself will remain at least until the Bankai has ceased entirely, so he does keep his buffs until the fight is over. And based on the fact Orohara still maintains his Zanpakuto, it's possible Kisuke has other crowd control options like the restrictive net created by Shibari Benahime, a blood-red bind that was strong enough to restrain a Hogyoku-infested Aizen. 
Shibari Benahime can also become a large destructive bomb capable of damaging this Hogyoku merged Aizen when activated. Another disadvantage Soul Society will be at is not many people are aware of Kisuke Urahara's Bankai. And surprisingly, Urahara is reluctant to even reveal what its ability is unless already blatantly obvious. The only people that have witnessed it and are alive to tell the tale are Captain Commander Yamamoto and Unahana Retsu, Captain of Squad 4, when Urahara performed his captain exam. Even stronger captains in the Gote 13, such as Captain of the 6th Division Byaki Akuchiki, may not overcome Urahara once Bankai becomes involved. Senbon Zakura is one of the most feared Zanpak Toe in all of Bleach, but if Urahara can just restructure himself to become more durable than Byakuya's blades, what comes after that? Byakuya is also strong enough to endure his own Bankai Blade Storm if surviving Asnot's use of Senbon Zakura Kageyosh is anything to go off of. So if Urahara can increase his strength past that level, it's possible that's enough to render Byakuya powerless. And considering Yorichi is capable of speed blitzing Byakuya, and Urahara is comparable to her when she's in an even faster form than this feat, Urahara can maintain an advantage on pretty much all combat fronts against Byakuya. I still think it may be possible to catch Urahara off guard with Shuke Hakuteken, the final ability of Senbon Zakura that concentrates all of its power into one blade for one last ultimate desperation move. And if Urahara isn't properly prepared, this accumulation of Byakuya's power may exceed the current restructured limit of Urahara's body. If this doesn't kill Urahara in one blow, however, Urahara can just rebuild himself even stronger. And while I think this is a well-fought battle on Byakuya's part, and would require more effort from Urahara than most, I think even Byakuya would fall to Urahara's resourcefulness. And the worst thing is, it might even be controversial to say, the strongest of them all, Kenpachi Zaraki, may also struggle with Urahara's Bankai. Now, I wouldn't blame you if you were to argue Kenpachi would just overpower Urahara no matter the situation, but let's stop and consider every aspect of this fight before we reach a conclusion. Kenpachi, if adapted to, and for once in his life, overpowered, doesn't really have any special abilities with his Zanpakuto, Nozarashi, Shikai, or Bankai, besides boosting his already impressive power level. Urahara would definitely need to restructure multiple times in this fight to keep up with every time Kenpachi increases his strength, but I think Urahara's intelligence provides him a massive advantage over Kenpachi. As we've seen opponents like Quincy Royal Guard Pernida Parkinja cripple Zaraki on sight if given the proper opening. And at maximum attack potency, Kenpachi Zaraki's Bankai builds so much power inside of his body that he's unable to properly handle it. Kampaji's own arm splits from just swinging his sword at Gerard Valkyrie, and although Zaraki is capable of swinging with Soul King level threats like Hikone Ibuginu in the Can't Fear Your Own World novels, it's also claimed Urahara can defeat Hikone as well, despite having less strength. If you don't believe the novel lore, and you're doubting that Kempachi, the man that can canonically slice through an entire meteor, or space it fucking self, can't beat Kisuke Urahara, I think the toughest thing for Kempachi to get past overall in order to win is if Urahara just hides behind his Bankai's range. Whether you think Urahara can keep up with Nozarashi's buffs and continue restructuring to stay on top of Kenpachi or not, anything inside of Kisuke's range, if he doesn't leave the Red Lady's side, will just become severed and torn asunder. And while Kenpachi should definitely outspeed a royal guard like Asuka Naklavar, who was able to see himself getting restructured and move out of the range before death, the littlest of restructuring could be enough to cut down Kampachi's damage level when striking through Urahara. Or at Benahime's most generous estimate, Benahime could actually just unravel Kampachi's arm and sword before any slash lands. Whether or not Benahime's restructuring catches Kampachi off guard depends on what stage of release Kampachi's in. As if Kampachi's even able to figure out what Urahara's Bankai effect is without Urahara revealing it to him, while Nozarashi is released in Shikai, Kampachi has his wits about him. But in Bankai, Kampachi's just a rabid berserk mental state and could fall for any traps laid by Urahara, marking Kampachi an easy target for Urahara in more ways than one. Now, if you believe Kenpachi Zaraki just plain outstats Urahara and Kenpachi can just cut right through Urahara's Bankai, I honestly wouldn't even debate you too hard, 
it's pretty reasonable considering just the kind of guy Kenpachi Zaraki is. But Urahara isn't a pushover either, and Kanan Baraki Benihime Aratame should, for all intents and purposes, let Urahara keep pace with and potentially surpass Kenpachi in power. At the very least, it will give Urahara the regen and longevity to survive as long as possible and keep trying. Depending on what you think the outcome of this fight is, it also probably depends your view on the Urahara vs Unahana fight if it happens. Now, this is where Urahara just starts losing steam in this Gote 13 gauntlet. I'm sure Kenpachi is already a 50-50 in the comment section, but it does work as a great bridge to this next portion of the video, where Urahara is going to be encountering the captains that give him the biggest problems. The first standout matchup would be Hitsugaya Toshiro. It's mostly due to Hitsugaya's ice having the ability to potentially offset Kisuke's restructuring. While Urahara should definitely have higher levels of combat experience than Toshiro, his Zanpakuto Yorinmaru is the strongest ice sword in Soul Society for a reason. With one of the largest ranges in the entire series, Hitsugaya is able to control the weather itself. Although Hitsugaya claims he's not a fan of using this ability since he can potentially kill allies in the vicinity, this gives Hitsugaya plenty of ice attacks to trap, crush, and catch Urahara off guard. Hitsugaya can even make use of the weather itself to freeze Kisuke. Although it is possible Hitsugaya's Bankai isn't powerful enough to kill Urahara, as despite Hitsugaya having attacks like Hyoten Hyakaso that are said to snuff the life out of an opponent once the last snow petal falls from the ice prison, Espada 3 Tier Harable was able to survive the technique regardless once Wonderwise Margera brushed the attack off of her. If you still wanted to give Urahara the win up until now, I wouldn't blame you, but it's Hitsugaya's complete adult Bankai that presents the true threat to Urahara. When Hitsugaya ages his body in order to better regulate all the spiritual pressure within, Toshiro's stats significantly increase to the level he's almost able to kill Quincy Royal Guard Gerard Valkyrie in Immortal. And what's most dangerous is that Hitsugaya also gains the ability to quote unquote freeze techniques or abilities themselves. Hitsugaya can render anything he touches powerless by flash freezing it, removing any supernatural abilities from whatever he just made contact with. This isn't some special attack he has to cast either. Its nullification property is carried over to all of the ice Hitsugaya generates. Anything that touches Hitsugaya is also immediately frozen, meaning his defenses are impenetrable and can also steal all power from you at the same time. When fully concentrated, Hitsugaya can flash freeze everything in a wide area in front of him in a snap, and this attack can be charged for another use in only 4 seconds of cooldown. With adult Hitsugaya's massive range, inability to be harmed, and the fact anything he freezes immediately loses all of its power means Urahara's restructuring is pointless. No matter what durability Urahara builds up to, it will end Urahara's Bankai immediately, which tells me everything I need to know about the outcome of these two's battle. If Hitsugaya goes adult, Urahara has no chance of surviving Hitsugaya's power nullification, besides maybe escaping through a restructured hole in the ground, and even then, Hitsugaya will charge up his ice and freeze the entire vicinity, or just chase Urahara down until it's all over. No portable Yigai is gonna get Urahara out of this one. Mayuri Kurotsuchi would be another great fight for Urahara, just based on the two's minds going back and forth to outsmart or outinvent one another. It's stated multiple times throughout Bleach that Urahara's genius does outrank Mayuri's, although the gap between them can't be too large. Urahara surely has more combat potential, though they were both able to conquer a Quincy Royal Guard, and Mayuri's opponent was a piece of the Soul King, no less. Mayuri's final Bankai, Kanjiki Ashishogi Jizo Matai Fukuin Shotai, ironically, is a Bankai that gives birth to a brand new power, a new Bankai specifically engineered to overcome whatever obstacles are in front of Mayuri. The perfect parallel to the scientist in Kisuke Urahara who can restructure anything and everything to fit his needs at the time. While Orohara's Bankai should allow him to override Ashisogi Jizo's base poison abilities and the area effect attacks of its Bankai, it is possible Mayuri could devise a new Bankai that could not be restructured. 
similar to how Mayuri creates the perfect counter to Pernida's nerve shrift. But this, funnily enough, creates a chicken or the egg problem. What overrides what? Mayuri's Bankai that can't be restructured? Or Orohara's that can quote unquote restructure everything and anything? Even if we were to give Mayuri a Bankai that can't be restructured, is Mayuri able to gift himself that same immunity? Since Mayuri could still be at threat of being restructured himself if he can't, and even if again that is the case, is that even enough insurance to provide Mayuri a win condition against Orohara? who still is probably a better combatant than Mayuri and almost killed Aizen three times over himself. It's possible Mayuri can create some kind of invention to damage Urahara beyond restructuring, but that also implies Urahara has the potential to respond with a similar plan of his own. I think no matter who wins, this would be one of the most interesting fights in history, and I would pay Kubo a lot of money to draw this up. And Kyoraku Shunsui is the last standout matchup for Urahara. Kyoraku is smart, easily decoding high-level enemies like First Espada Coyote Starks or Quincy Royal Guard Lil Baro's fighting strategies on the fly. Kyoraku survives point-blank Saros from the number one Espada with no noticeable injuries and fights valiantly after taking multiple hits from Lil Baro's X-Axis Shrift. And most importantly, Kyoraku is not afraid to do whatever is necessary to win, just like Kisuke becoming a Shinigami revered enough to be promoted to the next Captain Commander after Yamamoto passed. Yamamoto claims Kyoraku and Ukitake are probably the most capable captains among their peers, and Kyoraku proves this in the Blood War by standing his ground against the strongest Sternritter, essentially a god, Lil Baro. Kyoraku Shikai Katen Kyokotsu also employs the use of children's games in real combat making his opponents follow the rules of the games that Kyoraku declares. Otherwise, they can be penalized or give Kyoraku an advantage in the fight. This will make Orohara play by Kyoraku's rules, potentially opening Orohara up to attacks that just ignore his Bankai's abilities. Kyoraku can play games like Takaoni, where whoever is higher wins, or Kageoni, where the person whose shadow gets stepped on loses. This game also allows Kyoraku the ability to outright manipulate shadows, hiding in them and traversing through them for sneak attacks. Kyoraku can also create shadow clones to fight his opponent. There are also games like Iruni that allow the two players to declare colors, and what colors someone is wearing determines where one of the players can attack the other. If the opponent isn't wearing a lot of that color, the damage is lowered, but if they're wearing a lot, attack power is maximized. This means even if Orohara lands a lethal blow, if it doesn't follow the rules of the game, the damage just gets minimized. There are plenty more games for Kyoraku to take advantage of against Urahara, even while Benahime's Bankai is in effect. And the worst part is, Kyoraku doesn't even have to let Orohara know what game is being played or explain the rules to him, giving him a taste of his own non-explanation medicine. But in my opinion, what really seals the deal in Kyoraku's favor is his own Bankai, Katen Kyokotsu Karamatsu Shinju. Kyoraku's Bankai range is so massive, he had to isolate himself completely from the rest of his allies to ensure none of them got caught within. And even then, people like Ichigo Kurosaki could still feel the melancholic atmosphere as it took effect. The large area just means Urahara can do little to escape, and once it's active, no restructuring will save him, as Kyoraku's Bankai acts like a theater play, moving from one act to the other against the victim's will. The first shares all of Kyoraku's wounds with Urahara, ignoring all durability and transparency. These shared wounds are unable to be healed, as they will just simply reform. The Bankai's second act forces open Urahara's pores and creates bleeding sores from a lethal, incurable illness. And when the third act begins, a heavy ocean fills the entire range of Kuraku's Bankai, absorbing any and all Reiatsu inside until everything within is drowned. This sea of depression would drain Urahara of his Bankai abilities, slowly undoing any restructuring he's done to himself or others, as well as removing any potential traps or inventions that may have provided Urahara a way out. The suffocating sea of the third act is inescapable, the victim finding themselves swimming in circles if they even try. And at the end of the play, a tight string ties around Orohara's throat as Kyoraku decapitates him, 
causing Urahara's body to explode from the inside out, tearing the being apart with no way to recover since Urahara's Ryatsu has been reduced to zero. If the fight comes down to Bankai versus Bankai, I don't see a win condition for Urahara here. Even in Shikai, Kuraku's probably one of the most formidable opponents Urahara would be going up against in his conquest. While Hitsugaya wins with a desperate measure, Kyoraku can match Urahara step for step until eventually just coming out on top. Kyoraku does well in filling Captain Yamamoto's shoes here as the one to put an end to Urahara Kisuke's evil reign for sure. I think it's clear, on his own, Kisuke Urahara would not be able to take down the entire Gote 13. Especially considering there are still threats like Captain Commander Yamamoto, whose entire power could shake all of Seireite, or even Ichigo Kurosaki himself, another Soul King candidate. In fact, in the novels, when asked if Kisuke Urahara would ever become evil, he admits there's people out there like Ichigo who would just pull him back down to Earth. And although Urahara clearly means with friendship here, it's also clear end of series Ichigo Kurosaki would just clap Urahara into the Shadow Realm. If Urahara was able to create some kind of weird army of holified Gigais or enlist the help of Arankars or Quincy's, perhaps even better, if Urahara was to fuse with the Hogyoku like Aizen, would things turn out differently? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you so much for watching this far, everyone, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.